Welcome to No Password Required, a monthly conversation that gives you an up close and personal look at the world of cybersecurity. Hello, and welcome to No Password Required, a podcast dedicated to exploring the minds and personalities that make up the field of cybersecurity. I'm your host, Ernie Ferraresso, and with me, as always, is Jack Clabby. We also have Pablo Torres coming up to have some fun with his segment, Positively Cyber. But first, we need to discuss who we have on the show. On the podcast today, we're going to chat with Scuba Steve Gary, who teaches cyber intelligence at the University of South Florida and is an associate professor of practice in the School of Information. Currently, Scuba is working on creating cyber intelligence reports that analyze ransomware and other cyber events in Florida. For his last report, he researched cyber events in Florida related to COVID-19. And following the upcoming election, he plans to create a new report analyzing cyber threats affecting Florida elections. In his spare time, Scuba also hosts a cybersecurity seminar every Monday night for local veterans in the cyber industry and manages the internship program for the cyber intelligence students at USF. Sounds like he has a pretty exciting uh, extracurricular life. But uh, that said... And now that we're all fired up about the show, Jack, how are you? Already doing great today. Doing great today. I tell you, I, I was thinking of you last night from a security perspective. I was going to say, I don't know how I feel nothing, about that. Nothing uncomfortable, but a security, operation security. So, you know, we're all doing a little bit of work from home, a little bit of work from the office. And my kids are sort of doing some in-school work and some school work from home. But my daughter was on an iPad last night uh, on the back porch and she was not using a headset or a microphone. And she was talking as loud as humanly possible. And I had to come out and say to her, we, if we can hear you inside, all of the neighbors around can hear you. Whatever you're communicating about is gonna to be told. So it's not just securing your systems, which we had done, but it's also keeping your voice down a little bit. So always a good reminder to everybody out there, your system is only as secure as, you know, um, as the loudness of your voice. Well, I think that's that's interesting because I, isn't that always the case? You know, when you're talking on your phone, well, clearly I have to speak louder. Why? Well, because the microphone's smaller. Right. With the holidays coming up, remember this too. When you're behind closed doors, if you are visiting your in-laws, right, you know, test it out, right? Talk first and uh, share the normal volume of your voice and say, Mom, can you hear me? And see what comes back, yeah. right? But yeah. I think that's a good lesson for all of us here. But we've got... We've got a lot going on in Florida these days. We've got a lot going on in cybersecurity. And we've had a lot of calls recently um, working with clients on ransomware incidents. Uh, you know, there was an announcement not too long ago uh, by the FBI about particularly difficult types of ransomware that are hitting our healthcare systems, right? Hospital groups in particular. Uh, large dollars, one aspect of these things, right? It used to be a couple hundred bucks, one or two Bitcoin. Now it's really seven-figure demands, if not eight-figure demands. And the second feature of these really bad ransomware attacks are the extortionate nature of it, where instead of just locking up your data, asking for some money for it to be freed up, these bad guys are taking the most sensitive data, running relatively sophisticated search terms for it, showing you little pieces of it and saying, we're going to post this up on our website unless you pay us. So it's not just about resiliency and having backups, but what's your strategy going to be if your personal information gets out there in the open? Some scary stuff we're dealing with. Yeah, and that's really interesting um, because, like you said, we've started, if you look back in time uh, and we look at, you know, the trends that you saw uh, and as ransomware started to kind of emerge, it was, like you said, the small dollar things, you know, people were holding some of your data. Um, and, I, and it wasn't until... I'd say fairly recently, you know, in, and I guess in geologic terms, um, you, you start to see that this is going well beyond the, where, you know, we can pay it and we can get on with our lives. Now we're talking, uh, you know, significant business disruption. You're talking about companies and organizations that can no longer work. Uh, if we look at it from the healthcare sector, what's even making it more frightening, um, I believe there was a case, was it in Germany? where they got hit with the, their hospital system was hit with the ransomware. Um, and then uh, because of that, because they couldn't access their data, they, they sent the woman to the wrong hospital uh, and then, and then she, she died. Uh, so now you're starting to see these types of 
uh, you know, real, I'll call them catastrophic effects, not just financially, but, you know, in human lives. Um, so, you know, ransomware and how complex it is, how it's moving forward, I think it only, it only gets worse uh, unless we, we take a, a more holistic view, like you said there, Jack, that it's not just, yeah, pay the fine back of your systems and off you go. It's, okay, well, now our data is out there, the sensitive data, what, you know, what's the plan? Yeah, and so we're getting some help. Um, you know, there's the FBI is being very proactive in sharing not just that this is occurring, but the technical details of what the bad guys are up to, uh, opportunities to patch, opportunities to look at systems and prevent these things. So it is helpful, you know, if, if our listeners are involved in protecting the outside of their, of their organizations, you know, there are resources that they can look to uh, to, get, uh, to get some assistance. You know, but at the same time, right, you know, so last month, this is in October, you know, you're, we're getting this announcement about specific good intelligence about the threat to the healthcare sector. But in that same week, there's an announcement from the U.S. Treasury Department, two separate entities in U.S. Treasury having to do with ransomware, neither of which are helpful. I'll just give you a, a quick snapshot in what these things are. All right. You know, there's always been that risk that if a company pays a ransom to someone who is listed on sort of, let's call it the U.S. banned entities list, we call that the OFAC list, that they could be seen as supporting terrorism. It, from a practical matter, that was really unlikely. And if you were using a third party to help facilitate the payment of the ransom, they had the list available. It was very rare that the list would ever match up against any known bad guys. Believe me, if we had this kind of intelligence on the bad guys, they wouldn't be out there anymore, right? But the latest announcement from, uh, from both OFAC and from another entity at the Treasury called FinCEN, right, which is a sort of crime section of the Treasury, uh, it basically said, hey, if you're someone who's working with companies and helping facilitate the payment of crypto or any other funds to pay a ransom, you may be what's called a money transmitter. And lo and behold, all these companies that were just f helping to facilitate these Bitcoin wallets are now money transmitters. What does that mean? Well, under federal law, that means you have to, f you have to comply with what's called the Bank Secrecy Act and you have to file a suspicious activity report if you make these payments. So it really just takes, you know, what was operating pretty well for the last five years as this sort of like small economy of paying off ransoms, all of a sudden it blew up right at a time when there's an attack, you know, on some of our real critical, uh, in, you know, I don't critical, whatever you want to call it, but our healthcare system and other B2B sort of entities. So not, not a good time right now to be involved in the ransomware world. Um, as yes. anybody. And the criminals probably are the most upset, Ernie, because they're not getting paid as easily. Well, that's right. Now, it, but I, isn't that, wasn't that the, uh, the, the, I guess the, the theory behind that is, is that, well, if we, we say we're not going to pay it, um, then they don't, that, that's like the deterrent. Well, you know, why did you rob the bank? Because that's where the money was. Well, if I <laughs> hold people for ransom and they pay it, then, then that's an easy way to get money. Um, what's the philosophy behind that? I mean, does it actually because I know you, you get you kind of conflicting guidance, so to speak. There's the, there's the legal, you know, we don't deal with terrorists, don't pay off the ransom. But then there's the practical part of it of the criminals are actually pretty savvy in the sense that they know that they're not going to go and ask for a, a huge exorbitant sum of money from someone who can't afford that. They, they'll they come back and say, oh, yeah, yeah for you company that oh, that's a, you know, a $2 million a year company, 10000 bucks, you can have your stuff back. Yeah. I hope, you know, it, it may work, right? So it's one of those things like a, like a, I don't know if it's a tragedy of the commons. I don't know what the, the, the philosophical point would be. But look, it's bad that we pay ransoms. If everyone just decided tomorrow we're never going to pay ransoms, sure. It would really affect this. Uh, but it's like public schools, right? Public schools are great, but uh, the one in my neighborhood isn't that good. I'm going to send my kid to private school, right? It's, we all kind of know what's good for everyone. And I think the government's trying to nudge us without going out and arresting everyone who pays ransoms, they're trying to nudge us in the direction and it may work, it may not. Um, you know, I love talking to insurance professionals about this because the, the government has good help and the government can you know, talk about what should happen. The insurance professionals tell us what does happen because it's their wallets that get opened up to pay a lot of these ransoms and they're paying. Yeah. The companies are paying, right? It's pretty rare that you call up your insurance company and say, hey, I uh, just want to let you know, we got a ransomware incident, and yeah, we're not interested in learning about paying. We just wanted you to maybe help us with the forensics costs. Um, that happens, but it's a little bit rarer. So, you know, people are paying ransom still because it's still your stuff. And even if you think 
you have good data, right, and good backups, and you have operations resiliency, you know, you might be able to knock a couple of bucks off the ransom, and your insurance may pick up a good chunk of it. And so you're you're paying where, you know, a week before the ransomware hit, you'd say, no, we'll never pay, right? People negotiate, people pay these things, and the psychology behind it um, is fascinating. That's why we always tell companies, make a plan in advance and then stick to it. Yes, yeah, stick to your plan. I would also add, uh, you know, make a plan, stick to it, and if possible, practice your plan. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, That's how many right. times, oh, oh, we've got backups. Well, do they work? Well, uh, I don't know. Okay. But all this talk of ransomware and the complexities and the ins and outs of it, um, very apropos, because uh, we're going to talk with uh, our guest here, uh, Scuba, Scuba Steve here, uh, right after the break. Have an idea for a guest or topic? Send an email to info at nopasswordpodcast.com. All right, welcome back. Our guest is Scuba Steve Gary, University of South Florida Associate Professor of Practice in the School of Information. Scuba, welcome to No Password Required. Thank you, Ernie. Glad to be here. Listen, uh, so for those of you who don't know, Scuba uh, and I go back, a long ways back, at least at least two, three weeks, um, uh, at yeah, maybe four, yeah, at USF. Um, he's been a, a great friend of uh, Cyber Florida, um, and, uh, and the other part that, uh, you know, I, I won't advertise for him, but I'm going to say it anyway, um, as much as uh, he is a good person, he does have one significant fault, and that's the fact that he was in the Air Force. Um, and being a former Marine, I have to give him uh, uh, abuse on that. But we're, we're the best services together. We, we're, we both go in first, except you guys go on the ground. We just go in the air. So we, we're, we're a little bit smarter, a little bit faster. I wouldn't say a little bit smarter. Um, the fact that y you guys stay in places that uh, have roofs and we, we are proud of the fact that we don't uh, is a whole other. That's a discussion for another time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, being from the Air Force, I'm assuming that uh, that scuba came from uh, the old call sign uh, uh, culture. So, uh, you know, how sc scuba? Do you, I mean, I don't see any. Uh, you don't look very aquatic right now. No snorkel and goggles at this moment. Correct. I I do not scuba dive. That's the irony of it all. So, uh, it, it started almost 20 years ago. My first day at Intel School. They were having issues with uh, students having depression, feeling low for whatever reason. I guess Intel school's too hard. I'm like, you don't have to be intelligent to be an in intelligence, but it's not, it's it's not, not that not a correlation. I got through it. Don't <laughs> so, uh, but the first day, they said, give yourself a positive adjective using the first letter of your first name. So, since my name starts with Steve or S, starts with S. But Steve, uh, you have to give yourself a positive adjective using S. So I said super Steve, jokingly. And everybody thought I said scuba Steve because that movie Big Daddy with Adam Sandler ah. just came out. So they were like scuba Steve. And from that day on, ah. it stuck like glue. I, I, <laughs> but there are much worse call signs. I'm sure Ernie can attest to that. <laughs> yes. so, so Scuba Steve is probably one of the best or nicest call signs one can have. So I've been blessed with that. And uh, so I go by Scuba. Everybody knows me as Scuba. Uh, some people forget my real name. Well, that's what we all call. Well, actually, you get to the other part of it is we forget your real name because you have two first names. Well, I actually have three. So I'm even better at poker than most people think. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so you've been, uh, how long have you been at uh, USF and in the, uh, the cyber intel uh, business? So uh, at USF, I've been there six years, ever since the uh, Master of Cybersecurity program started. But I've been doing cyber cybersecurity uh, for 15 years, uh, cyber intelligence, uh, almost that entire time. I, I did intel before cybersecurity, so... I've got over 20 years, 23 years intelligence on top of cybersecurity, but I tried to meld them before that was even a thing. Uh, cybersecurity was obviously the up and coming industry. Everybody was jumping ship to do that. But I realized 
just like air, land, sea, and space, we needed intel for cyber space. So I started doing cybersecurity on my own, got a Security Plus certification, uh, taking courses, and then got my master's uh, through Air Force Institute of Technology, cyber operations. So at, back then it was CNA, computer network attack, CND, computer network defense, and CNE, computer network exploitation. So I, I experienced all that, uh, brought that back to intelligence, and have been doing cyber intelligence ever since, and brought that to USF. So I teach the cyber intelligence courses for USF. And I think or believe that every company should be doing cyber intelligence because you need to know your enemy. So Sun Tzu, the art of war, you know, if you know yourself and know your enemy, you will never lose a battle. So as a cybersecurity professional, you should know who all your threats are, not just the ones and zeros piece of it, but who the actual threat is, whether it's a cyber threat actor, nation state, an organized criminal group, as we talked about the ransomware, which I can go on for a little while for that. Oh, well, please do. Oh, okay. no, yeah. so, <laughs> I'm like, if, if I have the mic, I'll just keep on talking. Um, so with the ransomware, the irony is Florida ransomware 16 to 19 report was published by Cyber Florida. The following day, the Mays ransomware group said they were going to quit doing ransomware. And I'm like, is that coincidence, or did we just cause them to stop doing ransomware? <laughs> well, I take credit. For that. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, we totally shot, shot them down. Yeah. yeah the but they've been talking about it since September. But we'll we'll act like we we did it. Yeah. So Maze Ransomware Group, one of the Russian organized cyber criminal groups or gangs, um, basically said they're going to back off doing ransomware. I guess they have enough money. They're like, all right, we took enough money. We're good for now. We'll get more Bitcoin later. But the other group, which is the Rook ransomware, it's uh, mm -hmm. Wizard Spider is the group that uh, controls that. They are the ones primarily behind the hospital attacks right now. And so they're being very active, taking advantage of our current situation. We've got elections going on, we've got everything going on. But because of COVID, they realize, especially with the recent surge and spike, they can make a lot of money because the hospitals need to operate during COVID. So they're taking advantage of the situation and hitting all the hospitals, which like we talked about, Jack, is that it's, it's obviously not the hospital's fault when they're, you know, compromised or there's ransomware on their network, but it's the criminals fault, the, the ones that are actually doing it. So, and that goes back to cyber intelligence. It's our primary focus is the person behind the keyboard. So computers don't hack computers, people hack computers. So, so we need to go after the people behind the keyboard. One of the, and one of the questions that comes up a lot when we're working with, with companies who are in a ransomware event is this idea that it, it is a breach and it is an installation of malware that is ransomware, right? And with, the sort of wizard spider operating uh, the way they operate, it's there's an exploitation. They might buy the exploitation, right? They might not even hack it. They acquire access. And then they wait. They're in there and looking around and timing it. And it's not, it's not as if they get in and then immediately they deploy their, their stuff, right? There's a waiting period where they're timing it. Is that, am I understanding that right? Like, how does that? Correct. So right now, one of their primary tools is the TrickBot Trojan that's been used in uh, banking uh, breaches in the past quite a bit. So what they've been known to do, and this goes across the board, is they monitor the network, uh, whether they're monitoring emails, so they can see how to uh, craft a phishing email. That way, whenever they send it, it's, you know, it looks legit. It could be from the CEO or CFO, whoever, some senior person within the organization. And it's like, you know, read this, this is your salary upgrade or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. And people are just eager to click. And next thing you know, you have malware or ransomware on your network. They are very good and keep getting better just because, just like anything, as we prevent something, they figure a way to, to get around that. So, you know, stop the phishing attacks. 
they'll they'll find another way in. But right now, the phishing email works, so that's what they're using, and it's been 100% success rate as far as they're concerned. But you know, it's a numbers game. They're going to hit as many hospitals as they can, and somebody's going to click. These are, I mean, what we're talking about now. Your experience here comes from a variety of different places, right? A lot of military service, a lot of training at different points in your life. And when you're teaching, you're teaching to students who are teenagers to some degree, right? I, I, you know, there's that phrase, college is wasted on the young. But what is it, what does a profile look like of a student who does well in your class? Okay, that's, that's a good question. So typically they have straight A's. Fortunately with our program, I, I think we've uh, been mainly focused on diversity because bringing diverse students into the program is the right thing to do. I've had students who can't spell cyber to those that can spell it in binary. So, you know, to be able to bring all those students up to a certain level where they're, they may not be the masters of cybersecurity uh, yet, but they all have a good understanding and can do cybersecurity to a degree. And that's, that's really what we're looking for is the, the eagerness from the students to learn cybersecurity, whether they were lawyers or nurses or whenever they come in, they're so eager about learning cybersecurity and it's something they bring back to wherever they come from. So the financial yeah. industry here is huge. So a lot of individuals from the big banks come in, learn it, go back and are able to apply it because they understand the finance side as well as the cybersecurity side now. What's the interest in government service from your students, right? I mean, because you know, we were joking around about it, about how sometimes the government helps and doesn't. But, you know, for you, me, Ernie, we all did some form of government service. You know, are you seeing that interest in your students? I would say the majority on the intelligence study side want to go work for the intelligence community. On the cybersecurity side, uh, it's probably 50-50 or maybe even 75 uh, private and 25 public. But the, the reason a lot of them are you know, partially discouraged with the government or the public sector is a lot of times, especially with the IC, the intelligence community requires a, a, a clearance, which sometimes they're unable to acquire, at least in a timely manner, and then they're discouraged and end up going to work for another company, and, which is unfortunate because we need as many, you know, cybersecurity professionals helping protect the nation. It's a national security issue as we do at all our big banks and companies and such. Changing gears a little bit, um, you know, with the election upon us, as it were, and the, uh, all the stories of election hacking, I guess Georgia just before uh, last week was... Uh, was under the uh, under the the jackboot of oppression, otherwise known as ransomware. Um, if you were appointed the uh, election cybersecurity czar, what's the uh, what's the you know what are you doing on day one? Uh, probably resign. <laughs> 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 I think czar is a, is a Russian term. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Just, I'm not saying it. Was it carefully chosen? Yes, yes. Maybe you know, understand your enemy. I'm sorry, uh, did I, I say the Russians are the enemy? And I am a Russian interpreter, so I can right. translate right. and interpret, no problem. So. But the uh, the first thing I would do, honestly, is call Cyber Florida and say, hey, Cyber Florida, can you help out? Help me with this, this monstrosity of uh, election systems that we have here in Florida. But the, the reality is, just like industrial control systems, election s systems should be uh, on closed systems, basically, because anything connected to the Internet is vulnerable, whereas if it's a closed system at each county or, you know, uh, polling station, they could either put it on an encrypted USB or something to that level, bring it physically. Again, physical security is huge. You know, you were talking about your daughter speaking loud, that's physical yeah. security, you know. It's like you, you need to be able to have the physical security, which is probably more so important, as well as the virtual security and, you know, all the firewalls and all that stuff. But from this aspect, if it's a closed system, they could easily have the information, the votes basically, you know, whether it's spreadsheet, whatever, you know, easy format, and then pass it up to the county, which passes it up to the state, and then you have it all together aggregated, 
you know, it, of course, requires a little driving, unless you're flying a helicopter or a small plane or something. But other than that, you know, we could have it all central. Yeah, we could have it all centrally located at UCF or something, you know, central Florida. That way, you know, all of it comes together um, at that point. But, yeah, if it's, if it's exposed to the Internet, um, you know, somebody's going to do something. It's amazing how we can run elections in other countries right, with greater speed and, and, and confidence than we can in our own. And I, I, it's almost like we should back out and sort of just treat it like, like we're not. I remember, you know, I think it was 15 years ago, the Iraqi free elections, where everybody walked out and they had a finger covered in ink. And that's like, yep, no election fraud there, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Unless you wrestle your buddy down and put their finger in ink because they're going to vote for the other guy, right? But yeah, but yeah you think that there would be, I mean, are are there teams deployed now? Maybe you can't tell us the answer to this, but I want to assume there are teams out there protecting our election systems right now. There are, and until we all have basically a, a, a election system that we use nationwide, you know, that's the issue is each state. So Florida and California were uh, notified by the FBI about election, the, the security of their systems. There were still vulnerabilities that needed to be patched. Um, so the, the fact that we don't all have the same systems that are, you know, secured in the same way, whether it's closed system, um, that's always going to be an issue. So especially if you have some doing, you know, mail-in ballots, how are they, you know, putting those into the system? How are they putting in, um, you know, any handwritten ballots? You know, so all these different factors that go into it. Um, you know, yeah. always think to Estonia, which, yeah. you know, they're the most wired country. They basically use a CAD card, you know, it looks like your uh, card with the uh, chip in it. And it does everything. They can vote with it. They can pay their bills with it. They, their insurance is on it. Their health records, everything's on this one card, basically. But they, they have it secure. It's a small country. It's easier to do, obviously, than what we can do here. But if you each had a CAD card or your, we'll say driver's license, but your your state ID that you could use to vote that basically it's already imprinted on there and it's secure. But, you know, until we get to something like that, we're always going to have his issues. Along, those, uh, along yeah. those Estonia lines, I mean, wasn't that was a result of their, uh, their, their I'll, I'll call it their, their cyber war with, with Russia. That, yeah. So they, they, they implemented that because their country was essentially shut down uh, by the Russians when was it was back in 90 or uh, no, 2000 2002 ish somewhere yeah, it was around, around, around that early time. 2000s yeah. Yeah. Um, but they correct it was because they were moving the tomb of the unknown soldier which yeah, was a Russian soldier, soldier. Yeah. yes and so it was supposedly nation state actors uh, that were attacking, but it, they were t taking down their government websites and really affecting their uh, their networks. You know, they couldn't do a lot of things because of that. And not only did they uh, build up their resilience and cybersecurity within the country, right. they also moved the NATO cybersecurity right. center to Tallinn, Estonia. And so, yeah, Estonia is, uh, if, you're, if you're in the, uh, the NATO cyber business, you, Estonia is the place to be. I mean, it's great to see, though, a solution that isn't a retreat from technology, but a solution that is, let's just do it the right way, right? Let's unify it, let's push, and let's develop something secure. We don't have to go to dipping our fingers in ink. Exactly, because like you mentioned, you know, if, if we were all on the same system and we had it secure, we would know, you know, if there was a, a breach or a hack or whatever, but whenever we have these... Uh, hodgepodge, you know, systems and everything's connected haphazardly, I mean, we're going to have issues. There's going to always be just like the Georgia ransomware issue uh, and then California and Florida not patching their election systems. And those things, I mean, unfortunately, they do happen. But if we did it across the board, we could fix it across the board. So, so um you know, I just I have to know, you, you come out of a military background, you've been teaching now for several years. What's your position on teachers wearing blazers? Oh, definitely. I mean, that should be a must. It should be a requirement. A pipe is also a, a definite. We all, 
have certain standards that we need to upkeep in academia. How much of what you're doing is mid-career folks versus undergrads? I mean, is there, I know there's a lot going on with sort of the master's degree in executive education at USF, but, but what's sort of the split in your responsibilities these days? Uh, so right now, uh, I'm, I'm strictly teaching grad students, okay. so uh, so it's the cybersecurity grad students as well as intelligence studies grad students. Uh, the cyber intelligence uh, crosses both degree programs. So basically the way we look at it, you have cyber, cyber security professionals looking to learn some intelligence, and then you have intelligence professionals looking to learn some cyber security. And uh, so we kind of bridge that gap. Yeah, and, it, and it's not something where you know, for most of these students, they have work experience between their undergrad and coming back for their master's, right? So they're bringing other things to the table. Correct, and that's that's one thing that we do obviously have some students that, or professional students going from undergrad to graduate, but the majority are individuals that come from primarily different fields, but cybersecurity and IT, and they come in uh, bringing a lot of experience. So the, the ones that don't have experience actually learn a lot from other classmates have experience. Well, thank you very much, Scuba. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to dig deep into the mind of Scuba with Ernie's Lifestyle Polygraph. Stay with us. You are listening to the No Password Required Podcast. We cover cybersecurity and a lot of other stuff. Welcome back. We're about to find out what really makes our guy Scuba tick. Are you ready for the lifestyle polygraph? Uh, depends. Is that a CIA lifestyle polygraph? <laughs> because if it is, uh, I won't pass. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but this may be worse. Okay, more invasive. Way more invasive. And so it's a series of six questions. Um, it's kind of a, a you know choose your answer, uh, you know, an either or. So we'll start with this one. It's a pretty easy a softball. Is the pen mightier than the sword? Yes, but the keyboard is mightier than the pen. Whoa, nice. Well deep, played, sir. That's deep. deep. That's good stuff. That's right. So, yes, these hackers don't need pens, don't need swords. They are able to get in just by a few keystrokes. Very wise. Okay, number two. More difficult. Appalachian Mountain Moonshine or Napa Valley Wine? Ooh. Well, I would definitely go with the moonshine, of course, but that's, that's only if I don't want to be coherent. If I do <laughs> want to be coherent, I will do the Napa Valley Wine. But Situationally dependent, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yes but. I like a good moonshine with flecks of something in it. Yes. Still, pieces yes. of corn still in the moonshine. I would say 2020 is a moonshine year, just throwing <laughs> it out there. So. <laughs> You're prop, yes. I'll get the t-shirts made up now. That, that's okay. right. That's I right. love one. <laughs> okay, here you go. This is, this is a tough one. Better crime fighter. Scooby-Doo or Flipper? T.J. Hooker? No, that wasn't one of the options. That was an easy one. That, was, that would no, have made it easy. Ob obviously, Scooby-Doo. I mean, really? not only because his name is very similar to mine, which is you know, cool, <laughs> but, I mean, they got a cool mystery van. I mean, they Scooby-Doo can kind of talk, you know, r r raggy. I mean, yeah. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Close enough. Where Flipper just rrr, 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 makes all kinds of noises. You need a translator, you know. Plus, Flipper can't go on land, where Scooby-Doo can go anywhere. That's and true. I think Scooby can actually type. I haven't seen him do it, but I'm pretty sure he can. So he could actually do some firewall setups and maybe do some other cybersecurity <laughs> stuff that we, we don't know about. He can always get with Legrand, do some digital forensics and go that route. So well, that's right. I, actually, I think Legrand was on an episode of scooby -Doo I think he at was. One time. I yeah. think he was. Um, and then he took his mask off. That's right. And I, I, the phrase, uh, uh, I think he would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for those meddling kids. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that's, so Scooby-Doo is in the lead on this one. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I can see where you would get with that. Yeah, Flipper, I mean, he's limited. I mean, and then also he's limited geographically in the sense that he only really worked 
uh, the greater uh, South Florida scene. Yes. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. he really didn't uh, you travel know. much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I can't think of any times where he got help from the Super Friends. No. Or, or the Harlem Globetrotters, for that matter. That's a good point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, we're going to travel back in time to a young, uh, young Scuba Steve. Uh, back when, you know, the, it may, maybe you had the facial hair. Maybe you were one of those kids that at the age of 10 you had a beard. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you're going to go to camp. Space camp or meatballs camp with Bill Murray? Ooh, that's, that's even tougher. Yeah, these are good ones. Um, I would just have to go with space camp because I was a big nerd. So Really? Yes, so definitely space camp, especially now with Space Force. Had I not retired from the Air Force, I probably would have put my hand up and said, put me in. I want to work with Steve Carell. Oh, yeah, that's, that's the show. Not, not the thing. But You're telling me John Malkovich is not the science advisor to the Space Force? I thought he was. Oh, you're going to say that's, that's crazy. Crazy. But honestly, I did go to a math club competition whenever I was younger, and those guys know how to party. Everybody thinks nerds are just, you know, it, they're like band geeks. Come on. They, they, that's it. Everybody watch American Pie band camp. So that's <laughs> That's all I got to say. <laughs> but, and even if all of them don't party, like the 10% or 20% who do are like really hardcore. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, you got to be very serious for that kind of stuff. I feel. Yeah. I, I went to that math camp thinking, uh, you know, it's going to be boring and no fun. And no, I, I realized quickly that they know how to party. So. Math camp. You know, let's see, there you go. This is something that, you know, we're going to put that one on the parking lot and we'll, we'll come back to that one. Because I, <laughs> uh, you know, I think that one, that's something out there for the kids out there. Yes. You know, we're trying, trying hard to get students, get kids interested in the STEM fields. Well, apparently the M in STEM, that's where you want to be. Yes. That's where you want to be. Okay, here we go. Number five, better use of technology, smartphone or Atari? Hmm. Well, I could break more stuff with an Atari than a smartphone. It's a lot bigger and heavier and stuff. But, um, so as a, as a kid, I played Atari, but I kind of stopped there. I, did, I, I never was a true gamer and went through all the different gaming systems. So Atari was definitely my gaming system back in the day. I mean, anything from Donkey Kong, Space Invaders, you name it. But... I'm thinking the smartphone, obviously, is, I mean, the fact that you're able to carry a little bitty phone around as opposed to a two-ton computer or supercomputer, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how much technology, uh, unlike today where kids are born with basically a smartphone in their hand, uh, we uh, didn't have them. I didn't have one until I joined the military, so, um, so it's... It's impressive to see how well the kids have adapted to the technology. Yeah. Like for them, they, they're like, what? There was a time without smartphones? I'm like, yes, there was. I mean, we had flip phones and then we, they, we had uh, beepers before that. Oh, the beepers. beepers. Yes. So, you know, for them, they don't realize how uh, much technology has changed over the last 20, 30 years. Um, but... Yeah, I would, I would definitely say the smartphone is, it's, it's everything. I mean, you can do everything. Like, I've got all my work emails. I've got Canvas, our learned, learning management system uh, for USF on there. So I can check in with students anytime, day, night. It's super easy. Which could be a bad thing if you're a student. Yes, yes. Unless you're checking in, yeah, in the middle of the night. Yeah, it's like, what that. are you doing up so late? No. <laughs> and the last one. You get to pick two people from any time in history to help you get out on the escape room? Uh, Two people. Escape rooms are fun. I, I like the, uh, I, I bought the, uh, the board games, basically the ones you can play at home. And, um, but any time in history, so I'll work backwards. So probably MacGyver, because he, he's got all the gadgets, of course. He can make anything happen. Oh, not, oh, not, not MacGruber, though. That's <laughs> totally different. Big totally difference. different. Big yeah, difference. Totally different. We don't need celery to get out of this escape room. <laughs> but the other person would be uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I, I've always had a 
very uh, high respect for you know what he was able to do in his time. To imagine what he could do now, or you know, if he's able to push the envelope that much, I mean, we we definitely have flying cars by now easily. So, uh, so those two, cars, yeah, yeah, we, we, we do. Yeah. They're just not landing well. No, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. But uh, so between them two, I, I believe we could escape any room. So, so you're not a gamer now. Um, but you, you know, you teach in a field where I think there's a lot of folks. I mean, everybody plays streaming video games. At least, not everybody, but a lot more people do it than I think you would think, right? You know, do you ever talk with your students about sort of their their time on Twitch or their sort of their gaming habits? I do, and it's it's funny because most of the games I've never heard of, at least the computer games. Yeah. Now, my my friend who just retired after 30 years in the military. He's a Call of Duty Xbox, so he got me on there, okay. and and I'm like the the slow kid. I'm like, <laughs> I'm getting killed every time, and you know he's he's running circles around me literally, and uh, so it, it's it's fun, but it's just not my thing or whatever you know. And the kids today, I say kids because most of them are adults um, or like closer to my age actually. They, they love all the different video games. There's so many out there. Most of them are using gaming laptops or gaming uh, computers. Um, they have to have the latest and greatest gaming console. Um, and obviously, those are all connected to the internet. They're yeah. all vulnerable. We've obviously seen you know, where Xbox and PlayStation, they've all been uh, breached or hacked at some point. But from a gaming perspective, um, it, it blows my mind how many different games there are, which means to me that there's that many more avenues to get in to yeah. the systems and stuff. Because I mean, some of these games you can't play unless you're on Exactly. That's and it, you have right? to sign up, like register yeah. or whatever. Everything's, you know, you've got to connect. You have to, you know, give them some personal information, your, either your email yeah. or whatever. So all these things, you know... It, it adds up quite a bit. I think that's interesting. One of the things that, you know, you're talking about the gaming, and Jack, bringing that up, the gaming community. Um, if you think about it, uh, we saw probably, I guess a couple, maybe three years ago, you, you started seeing some of these, um, you know, the, the, the Xbox accounts being stolen. Um, and now it, uh, I would be interested to see if you're going to start to see more, you um, I'll call it, you know, botnet type activity using some of these gaming consoles and computers because you're talking uh, these computers and systems have, you know, the pro uh, it, it, incredible po uh, processing power as compared to others. I mean, if you want to talk about, um, there was a time, and I'm, I'm sure they're still doing it, where you, these Bitcoin mines, they're going out and buying, you know, just a bunch of GPUs and stacking them all together so they can mine Bitcoin. And so, you know, now... You know, you've got a bunch of these, you know, high sp high speed processors. Uh, you know, maybe you know. I, I do, you know, What do you think about? Uh, is that is that is that the future, or is that now? Uh, yes, both. <laughs> so yeah, for di distributed denial service attacks, I mean, you can easily, you know, use. Uh, I guess we already talked about. IoT devices a little bit, Internet of Things devices, but same concept. The more th things you have connected, the more things the bad guys can use for a DDoS attack or crypto mining or using your processor power without you knowing mm -hmm. it for other malicious activities. So uh, they've had the coffee pot that was sending out spam. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so there's, you know, so many different... Uh, IoT and um, connected devices that will or can be used for bad, and because um, I think that'll be interesting to to see. And, and I, you know, thinking about it, if we're talking about you know AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and this has a you know it's going to have a significant drain on processing power. Now, let's figure out somebody now can tap into this this network of a. A lot of processing power maliciously. So now all of a sudden you can, I mean, is that good? That, 
I don't know, is that going to be one of these things that we need to be worried about, that the botnet of the Xbox that turns out to be Skynet, and next thing you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> shows up? It, it very well could be, especially as these, uh, like you said, the gaming systems are getting faster than some of the computers, the processing power, the new Xbox just came out, new PS4 or 5 came out. So we have all these new gaming systems that are um, just very powerful. So if you did connect them all, you have basically a supercomputer at that point, and you know, that, that can lead into not only artificial intelligence, but um, uh, decryption yeah. of you know, all our... Yeah, you start running a library attack using yes. you know, a bunch of gaming consoles with their processing power, and so. you can probably burn through that stuff a lot quicker, right? Yes. Do, do you lean in, so, you know, in your, in, in your personal stuff, like, do you lean into technology, or, you know, are you still reading a paper book? So, you... so I do pretty well everything on a laptop, okay. um, so I, I very seldom use paper books now, and it, partly because all the courses you take at universities, it's all, you know, PDFs or documents yeah. at this point, pretty much. You know, I mean, you can still get the hardback, but uh, the cost of a hardback isn't um, really worth it. So, and plus you can search PDFs and stuff like that. So it makes it a lot easier. Um, but the PDF killed the cliff note. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Old cliff notes. Yeah, that was my favorite. But, yeah, knowing um, where we're headed uh, with academia, yeah, I, I foresee uh, almost everything being online. It's, it's yeah. definitely, um, but I mean, we still need obviously all the books, the libraries, but whether they're virtual or physical. We try to use you know the concept of you know video conference bingo, which is at the beginning of the day, create a grid of all the teams, Slack, uh, Zoom. We use one called Loop Up, which no one really no, yeah. has, has heard up to, but it's very secure, so we use that one here, and. Um, put them all together, and then over the course of the day, cross off the ones that you use, and if you get three you get in a bingo. row, you get video conference bingo. And nice, you know. nice, yeah. And you get yeah. carbon fields coffee mug? That's right, we'll get yeah, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I know, there's so many apps and different ways to communicate now, so, uh, but yeah, fortunately, uh, because before we were having to use either Skype or Zoom, whatever we could get you know, our hands on, basically, or go through uh, what Canvas has, but, but fortunately, Teams has been, at least for us, very successful. You know, hasn't been dropping or any issues. And uh, but at first, I thought you were going to say the, the <laughs> like bingo with different people on the screen. Oh, like, I like that. Hollywood idea. squares, yeah. 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 Squares. And then, That's a great then, idea too. Be like, all right, if we have three fall asleep going, <laughs> 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 or something, you know, three get up at the same time, or something. Um, but, yeah, because. Yeah, the, the Zoom stories, every every day I hear, you know, a new one, of course, you know, people forgetting their cameras on doing something or uh, forgetting to wear pants and taking their phone. You forget to wear pants. Yeah, yeah. Bringing their laptop to I mean, the that's a big sign. with them. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, that, I, yeah, I can see that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but forgetting to wear pants, that's a hard one to, for me to swallow. I heard a flush the other day when the person had turned off their video. <laughs> yeah. And, and I thought, the, look, come on. Yeah, come on. A couple of rules. Yeah, either cover the camera, turn off the camera, mute your microphone. Yeah. You know, there's certain things, and uh, it's funny how many people uh, do not follow those simple rules. But yeah, so it's been interesting. You know, zoom bombing because yeah. anything in the background too. That that's I always look at. It might be the intel. I mean, you know, I'm always looking like what's in the background back there. What's what's going on back there. And uh, there's always something interesting, you know, whether it's a dog or, you know. A you carefully cultivated yeah, space yeah. sometimes, yes. and sometimes a haphazard, not yeah. cultivated space, yes. right? Yes, so that's why you got to well, use those standard backgrounds or something. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's a, that goes into a whole other tale of woe and misadventure that I can spend hours on when, you know, at work. This was years ago uh, we, when video teleconferencing was kind of coming to the fore. Um, and, you know, hey, we wanted to put the background. We were working at a, overseas, but we wanted to, people to believe that we were in the Vatican. So we tried to put a picture of the Vatican. <laughs> now, now, if not careful, you can see me on a Teams meeting where I will be traveling in the Millennium Falcon. No, we yes, I will. Nice. I have no problems doing that. Uh, All right. Luke Skywalker. So. 
Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I, I, I try to be professional, just like today, USF, you know, I even got a USF mask, and so I use a USF background, but every once in a while, I'll switch in, throw one of my old cars back there, and be like, all right, see if anybody notices. Uh, most of them don't notice, but it's a, <laughs> mostly nobody cares. Yeah, no one cares. Well, Scuba, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I would promote your social media here, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not your thing. Um, so uh, anything you want to you wanna plug here? Yeah. You can find me on notonsocialmedia.com. No. Uh, so I, I would like to throw some plugs out, of course, uh, just real quick. USF, of course, is College of Arts and Sciences, which is a college we fall under. We're information science, so school of information. Um, our, our programs and such, but I did want to point out for all the veteran listeners and anyone for that fact, uh, I'm the Military Cyber Professionals Association Tampa Chapter President. So if uh, yeah, interested, it, yeah. hey, at least someone's going to be president today, right? <laughs> so, um, so cyber, uh, it's milcyber.org if you're interested. Uh, there's a lot of good things going on there, but um, the main thing I would say is just get involved in cybersecurity, get involved with your, you know, whether it's through with academia, uh, even in your own building, you know, your, your IT folks, your cybersecurity folks, uh, try to, try to get involved with cybersecurity because again, our kids are the ones that are having to deal with it today. So if we can pass down to our kids, the importance of cybersecurity, teach them some math, go to math camp, and uh, <laughs> then they can help protect themselves and hopefully our future will be safe and secure. We won't be getting hacked and ransomware and all the things we're dealing with today. Well, coming up next, it's Positively Cyber with Pablo Torres. He's going to share his take on Peter Quill. Yes, that's right. He's discussing Star-Lord in his cybersecurity chops. You don't want to miss it. There's a place for everyone in the world of cybersecurity, and Pablo Torres plans to prove it. Welcome to Positively Cyber. Welcome back. For our next section, we have Pablo Torres, Positively Cyber. Pablo? Thank you, Jack. Welcome to Positively Cyber. I'm your host, Pablo Torres. All right, let's get to it. On every episode, we're going to venture into the realm of our lion-hearted Hollywood guardians whom triumph over villainy and foes. We're going to decide if they possess the grit and tenacity to contribute as an exceptional cybersecurity professional. If our hunch is right, we will also identify which position would best complement their abilities. Full disclosure, I believe that there is a place for everyone in the cyber field, and this episode's subject may be headed straight to the top of the organization. Without further ado, today we are going to explore Chris Pratt's character, Peter Quill, also known as Star-Lord, aka leader of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Mr. Quill is no angel, and he's ecked out a living through petty theft, cons, and other nefarious activity. He's not perfect, nor will anyone ever will be, as long as we have the notion of humanistic psychology. He does have a bit of a sketchy past, however, it's not too much of a concern for me. I believe it's never too late to put on a white hat for the overall enhancement of our society, our galaxy, and the online mediums that we use to transcend borders. Pete Quill exhibits a lot of qualities that would make many of the top cybersecurity executives salivate. This guy is creative, he is persistent, he's a problem solver, he exhibits leadership and capabilities that really demonstrate his abilities to adapt and know how to build a team. Now these are all great soft skills that just about any sector would appreciate. But the real question here is, how do they translate specifically to the cyber field? Let's start with the problem solving. I don't believe that there's a cyber criminal in this world that would be prepared to deal with a white hatter that is willing to settle an interstellar war with a dance battle, let alone someone who is not upset to be forcibly dragged away from his home planet. He certainly embodies strong attributes of adaptability. He's got his own ship, calls his own shots, and he gets to fly from planet to planet blasting 70 pop music hits, making tons of friends along the way. When Peter was abducted by the Ravagers, they wanted to eat him. 
and it was only the intercession of the Ravager's captain that allowed Peter to survive. Once he was off the menu, the crew decided to train him as a Ravager, giving him the skills he would then use in his day-to-day -day life to be a space adventurer and outlaw. Let's transition to something that can be more relatable to the world of cyber. Sometimes stopping an APT group, an advanced persistent threat, a threat actor or a cyber criminal hinge on one's ability to stay a step, or in this case, a two-step ahead of the perpetrator. His leadership and team building abilities go hand in hand with one another. Not only is Mr. Quill capable of acquiring talent that includes specialists such as Rocket, a cybersecurity engineer, and Drax, the penetration tester, he also does an incredible job managing their sometimes volatile personalities. Our hero of the day may not be a perfect fit for some of the more technical jobs within the industry. After all, he is still using Microsoft Zoom. <laughs> but there is hope. He is definitely an early adopter as far as weapons go. While we are at it, let's be frank. Cybersecurity at its core is an ever-evolving battlefield. While he does not have superpowers, his quick wits favor him in conversation and in battle. And he often manages to find some unlikely solutions to seemingly insurmountable problems. Deep down, Peter Quill is a good man with a solid set of priorities. He's a loyal friend. He will always risk his life to protect the freedom of our galaxy. Because of his leadership abilities and never quit attitude, I am totally comfortable placing Star-Lord near the very top of my fictitious organization. Mr. Quill, welcome aboard. You are my chief technology officer, sir, and we look forward to following your leadership as we secure the wild, wild west that we call the interweb. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was Pablo Torres and Positively Cyber. I tell you what I like about this, right, with Peter Quill is he, he has sort of, he's presented in, in the movies and the comics as a charming guy who is kind of a wisecracker, but then when you see the actions he takes, he knows how to use the technology, right? He knows sort of the basics of aerodynamics, serious mechanical chops like Han Solo in a way, right? He can't just pilot and fight, but he can also fix the darn Millennium Falcon, right? So Peter Quill can fix stuff that's broken. So I think that's exactly right. So if you're sitting someone at the top of your organization, yes, they need the leadership skills and sort of the ability to speak in public and handle themselves. But if they don't have that backup, that ability to actually fix the broken stuff, I think you're going to have a problem. And that's exactly, I think, what he has. Spot on, spot on. It's, um, it's interesting. I mean, and you bring up some very good points. Adaptability would be the one focal point of the foundation that established this fictitious organization. Cyber is ever evolving. We find ourselves in a position that, hey, the intel that we have today is obsolete because the adversary is all work, already working on tomorrow. So given that, I think collaboration really comes down to the core of any successful unit, team, or aspect of a mission. If you can put yourself in a situation where you can handle volatile personalities and target your objective, set realistic goals, and implement key performance indicators that allow you to properly follow a plan of action to execute, I think you're definitely going to lead a team in the right direction. And Peter Quill, in my personal opinion, really embodies an individual that can go ahead and take very sour lemons and turn it into very sweet lemonade. It, it comes down to a mentality and understanding that in this field, you're never going to know it all. You'll never be in a position where you are the top subject matter expert or subject matter advisor in any subject. But if you walk into a room and know that you're here to collaborate and to contribute to the mission, I think we can definitely come out with some very positive outcomes. Hence, the Positively Cyber. That's some words to the wise there, Pablo, and thanks for that. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to this segment because I think there's a lot of places we can go as we build out this organization. So that brings us to the end of our program. Thank you for joining us. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my co-hosts, Jack Clabby and Pablo Torres, and a special thank you to our guest, uh, Scuba Steve Gary. Please uh, take, a, take some, a moment, rate us, review us, and subscribe to uh, No Password Required Podcast. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them to info at nopasswordpodcast.com. Uh, that's info at nopasswordpodcast.com. Dot com. I'm Ernie Ferreso, and uh, thank you very much for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. 
Thank you for listening to the No Password Required podcast. The show is produced by Cyber Florida. A special thanks goes out to our friends at Carlton Fields and Cognizant. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast, visit our website, cyberflorida.org slash pod.